Okay, I think the food was okay. Uh, <laughs> hope it was a little better than okay, but anyway, it was, it was a wonderful meal. And so I appreciate those who helped uh, provide for us to have a, our very own creamy truck here. That was a nice addition. Uh, so next year, uh, we'll, you know, I don't know, Pastor Rob and I were just talking, you know, this is meant to build up to the 50th. So, you know, we, we can't take all the stops out before we hit 50, all right? So on the 50th, I guess then it'll be the elephant. I know, we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a wonderful meal. And uh, we're looking forward to this afternoon and all the Lord has for us. And uh, so... I hope you make, I mean, after, after we're going to take a little time just to, to we're going to show a little history video, uh, take some time to give some testimonies of Thanksgiving for Cheryl. want to mention again, out in the lobby is a, Insta, a camera for you to take a picture of yourself, your family, uh, and then leave, uh, there's a memory book there. We'd love you to leave a personal note uh, for Cheryl to thank her uh, for her service, her kindness. And uh, if you do that, I think that'll be a special memory. We have a gift for her as well that we want to present a little bit later in the service. Uh, and then we're going to, we have a, a booklet, just kind of, a, we've started strategic planning a couple of years ago, uh, began really looking at and evaluating ministry. So we're, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly this afternoon. I'm not going to take a long time. I, I do not want to insult anybody's intelligence. You can read this, but this document represents really two years worth of work, beginning towards kind of a 10-year vision. Uh, so there's about two years worth of work that's kind of gone into this. Uh, so a little bit of thought been put into it anyway. So Either that or we're just a little slow, but one of the two, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're working on it. Uh, so we want it to be a, a vision forward. Uh, so we'll talk about that and then uh, introduce, also just show you a drawing of what we're thinking about uh, in terms of the plan for the kitchen. So, uh, and we'll close with taking our anniversary offering. So that's kind of the lay of the land. Uh, but let's, um, I'm going to ask Pastor Rob to come and open us in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time of remembrance today. Father, we see times in Scripture where uh, you point your people back to remember uh, the great things that have been done. And Father, we thank you for your goodness here in this place for 47 years that you have been faithful and that you've allowed uh, many people over those years uh, to serve here. And Father, we thank you for um, Pastor Sirspaugh and the fact that he's been able to be with us today. And uh, we thank you that as he's been faithful to you, that he was faithful to this local congregation. And we think of uh, the Renos as well and many others uh, that could be named today, but these uh, two that we give special recognition to today for uh, people that are just faithful to your work, that have served you uh, faithfully. And Father, I pray today as we look back at those uh, times of remembrance that we give uh, the glory to you. It is only through you that anything is accomplished. But we thank you for uh, the founding of this church, the history of this church, and we look forward to the future. This is your church, and we uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, serve in it, uh, just to be servants of you, instruments of you. Thank you for uh, the current pastor that you have for us here, and we pray uh, for him, that you would continue to use him and, and bless him and help us to uh, follow our pastor as he follows Christ. Father, we uh, come to you today. We, we love you, and we uh, just look forward to the great things that could be done. We pray that uh, we would continue to have a wonderful fellowship here, that you would protect the unity of the body as we uh, move forward. And Father, we uh, have been very careful to do our best to make sure that our mission is a biblical mission. And Father, as we uh, look forward to being disciples that would make other disciples, Father, would you do a great work here that we would see uh, souls saved and people added to our church. And so we ask for this, Father, we ask for your blessing on our time together. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
how fitting it is to begin in song this afternoon with Great is Thy Faithfulness, but I gotta ask you to stand and sing with me, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all he has. On July 2nd, 1972, eight people met at the Chamberlain School in South Burlington for Sunday morning worship. They were led by Paul Weaver, a young pastor working under the church planting outreach program of Bob Jones University. It was in the gymnasium, of course. Actually, it was a multi-purpose sort of a room that they used for lunch and so forth, as I recall. There was a small room off to the side, and that's where we kept the piano and the hymn books. We had a box that somebody fashioned of wood to hold the hymn books in, so we would collect them every time. We got our folding chairs out of there, We'd set up before the service, lay out the hymn books, and Pastor had a uh, pulpit that he had fashioned out of three pine boards that were hinged so he could fold it in, into a flat piece and kind of stick it in the corner and then he'd bring it out, you know, and it was quite functional. One time we had a Christmas program and not being a lot of members, uh, the members had to double up and take two parts 
get in, into the audience to watch the program and then go up and uh, play a part and so forth. <laughs> the church met regularly at the Chamberlain School for several years. As their membership grew, the people of Trinity began seeking a building permit and land in Williston to construct their own church building. They finally settled on a parcel of land on 2A near the intersection of Mountain View Road. Construction on the parsonage began in the spring of 1974. It served as both the pastor's residence and the meeting place of Trinity Baptist School, which started that same year. Early in 1975, the first phase was begun on the construction of a church building. The first building was just basically an, the main church building. It didn't have the gym and it didn't have the classroom wing on there. It was just one straight building. We made some benches out of planks and concrete blocks. We probably had a chair or two around. We didn't have a furniture budget, so we just did whatever we could do. Those meetings were held in the cellar of that building. One of the things that had to happen there was we had to um, seal the foundation to prevent leakage and so forth. I believe Wayne Reno and myself and the pastor, we went out after a prayer meeting and we had these buckets of tar. In those days it was a metal bucket. We set the buckets up and we had propane torches and we actually made the tar hot so we could smear it on the outside of the walls. Everything was excavated and the next day they had to come and backfill and so we stayed out probably till midnight that night and we had whatever we'd get our hands on, brooms and brushes, and we, the three of us went around that building and we put this black stuff on. The reason we had to make it hot was it was in December and it was very cold, freezing temperatures. There's no way in the world we could have done that without heating the stuff. We had a wonderful time. But we did a lot of stuff like that. We stayed up late into the early in the next morning to get, to get a job done. Work continued on the building and in 1979, wings were added to the exterior. This undertaking was named Project Jerusalem. While the building was underway, the church continued to grow. People's lives were being changed by the preaching of God's Word and the working of the Holy Spirit. As the membership continued to grow, the church began to need more space and a larger facility. It was then that the leadership began to look toward a large parcel of land adjacent to the property on Mountain View Road, where the church stands today. Of course, first we purchased the land, and then they, Paul Weaver and him and, and the deacons and, and other people that were savvy as far as how you build, what, what you do to build, to, to do plumbing, to do electrical, uh, they all worked together. The first wall that went up, they got a section of wall up, and that night, it, it was a very windy night, and the wind knocked that first section over, And uh, but they picked it up, and uh, I don't remember how they did it, but they started again and eventually got the, the building built, you know, the, the frame put up, and I remember walking down here to work on certain por portions of the building, and uh, we'd be maybe upstairs working on something up there and then the, the snow coming through the <laughs> because the building wasn't closed yet snow coming through into the into the building it was a good fellowship time and a lot of very close bonds built i think among the men we were pulling 50 to 56 hours a week in construction and all of the men in the church came in on tuesday and thursday nights for four hours and then all day saturday eight hours and that's what we would do. We would, we'd come in here and we'd, we had insulation crews, we had electrical crews, we had uh, plumbers. Men brought the different tools that they had. It just strikes me uh, who God brought at that time to build the church. They say probably around 20 of us uh, young, young guys, which kind of struck me when we look back at the pictures and realize, yeah, I guess we were young guys back then. And had the energy, you know, to work 40 hours at our regular jobs and then come here and work 20 to 40 hours a week for a year or two uh, to build a facility here. I can remember at one time thinking almost like this was heaven. 
this great fellowship and worshiping and, and all of that. I, I just remember that thought going through me, wow, this will go on forever. The prophet Isaiah writes, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. After many years of spiritual growth and progress, Trinity Baptist Church suddenly faced a dark and difficult time. The pastor, Paul Weaver, was forced to resign and left the ministry in the fall of 1987. It suddenly came to light that the ministry had accumulated a debt of more than $1 million, a staggering amount for a congregation of that size. Meanwhile, many church members left, causing the congregation to dwindle to fewer than 100 people. God used this difficult circumstance to challenge the faith of the members that remained and caused them to realize that they should look for a leadership not in a man, but in the Lord. I'll never forget the night I was contacted by one of the deacons. And he told me the pastor was in trouble. and We went to meet the people that were bringing the charge. The long and short of that was is we had to keep church going. We couldn't just just throw up our hands and say, okay, that's it, you know, we're out of here. First reaction is shock, but it was very interesting uh, the way people reacted. Some, and, I, and this is the way I try to be, you know, you got to keep your eyes on the Lord. You know, this church is, is built based on the Lord, built on the Lord. It's not built on Paul Weaver. There were some others that, you know, couldn't believe that their pastor had betrayed their trust. And, you know, my wife and I, you know, spent many long evenings talking to people. The thing that I remember about that, the tragedy was, was all the people that were so, uh, they just weren't grounded in the faith and it really broke them and they, the sheep were scattered, so to speak. The different ones that just went different directions. And some of them have come around and some of them never, never have recovered. It was very hard, but of course God was faithful and we had uh, wonderful men come and preach for us, and then finally we got an interim pastor. Well, the whole experience was a little bit like being shell-shocked. We were just, you know, emotionally really, uh, really hurting. I don't know, it's hard to, hard to put it into words, I guess, but it's just, there's times when you just feel very stressed, and then, and then the Lord gives you peace through it all, and you can see events and uh, people that the Lord has brought through that really carries you through and he said okay yeah, the Lord is there this is his work <laughs> it's it's going to uh, his, his will is going to be accomplished the Lord answered the prayers of his people by sending them a new pastor a mere four months after the previous pastor had resigned the man God sent to pastor the church and help it to heal was David Sturzbaugh, a man much loved by the people of Trinity. He and his family came to the ministry in March of 1988 and served faithfully until the Lord called him to Arizona in the fall of 2004. During these years, the Lord blessed the ministry both spiritually and financially. The church was able to completely pay off the mortgage they had carried for nearly 20 years. The body of believers also grew, both in numbers and in the deeper understanding of God and His Word. Through the Lord's grace, Trinity once again became a vibrant and solid ministry. Today, God continues to use the ministry of Trinity Baptist Church and School in the hearts and lives of its people. You know, we were a bunch of guys that built a whole bunch of buildings here, but that's not really what ministry is. We've got to build people's lives. And that's what the Lord wants, is for them to work on building people's lives. I would have to concur with Pastor Sturzbaum. It's a, it's a place of miracles. We had an enormous debt. When you stop and think about it, it scares you. I mean, a million dollars 
Today, nobody, you know, people, it's a lot of money, but back in 1987, it was a whole lot more money. But God just, through a series of miraculous events, allowed us to raise the money we needed to pay off the, the creditors. To me, that that is kind of the greatest blessing right there, just to see God's hand at work and, and to, to know that He was in this place. sacred ground. It is the place of miracles that God, it required a miracle a day when I got here uh, in those days. <clears throat> the congregation was uh, very fragmented and they weren't going to believe a word that the, another pastor came along. Um, though they wanted to, they were shell-shocked, they were in pain. And understanding that, um, uh, it, it, I just began to love them. And uh, it was really painful for me <clears throat> when I came here. I had left a successful church in Illinois and led a bunch of people to Christ. And uh, they trusted me implicitly. <laughs> and when I came to Trinity, it was not that way, and I understood. I mean, I didn't know whether God had called me here for a funeral or a resurrection. <laughs> I, I really had no idea, but those first months, those first few months, I averaged, uh, we, we owed $1.2 million in long-term debt. And the day I walked into the office, there was a stack of bills that high, about $90,000 of uh, per current pass bills that were not paid. And I averaged those first three months, I averaged about five creditors a day that called and were dinging for money, and we didn't have any. <clears throat> and I kept telling them, I've got the property for sale up here, and as soon as we sell that property, I'll pay you off first. And they said, oh yeah, that's what the last guy said. <laughs> we want our money and we want it now. But one of the stories that I don't think probably anybody here knows is that it was during those days when, uh, when I first got here that I got a telephone call from a reporter from the local newspaper. And that reporter said, I called to give you a heads up that tomorrow I'm going to run an article in the newspaper about the former pastor. And she said, I just wanted to verify all of, the, uh, all of the information with you. And so she went through the series of things about, the, uh, uh, about all of those things, and she had it right. She had all the names right. She had all the times and dates right. She had it right. And she said, I just called to give you a heads up that tomorrow I'm going to run that article, and it'll be the lead article on the front page of the newspaper. And I said, just, just a minute, ma'am, before you hang up, I said, if I were you, I wouldn't run that article. And she said, why not? I said, well, you know, the former pastor is suing the church. And I said, if he would sue his former church, don't you think if you just messed up one little thing that you would get sued for libel and for slander? The article never ran in the newspaper. <laughs> God spared us. That was a first miracle. Because if that had showed up in the newspaper, the, the community, where there were already rumors in the community, but there was never anything publicly verified, and it gave, it gave us a lease on life. It was the miracle of God, really. And, uh, and I could talk about all the miracles that God did here, um, just one right after another. It took a miracle a day for us to survive in those days, and God just did miraculous things one right after another. Um, it was incredible. i just close with this one. Um, we had to sell that property. I had to sell that property. 
The problem was it could only sell to a church or a school. That's what it was zoned for. And we couldn't get it zoned any other way. I tried. I could get businesses that would wanted to buy it, but I couldn't get a church or a school that would buy it. Finally, we got, we got a buyer who was interested, Pine Ridge School. And so uh, we were ready to, uh, they, they were agreeable to the selling price. We we're selling it for $650,000. And uh, they were agreeable to the price, but they wanted to use it for dormitories for their school in those days. And so that it had to have a certain septic capacity for the showers and you know for all of the dormitory stuff. And it didn't meet that capacity. And so I got a call from the from the headmaster and he said, I'm sorry, you know, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to pull out of the deal. They hadn't signed anything, just an agreement, uh, verbal agreement. So uh, I said to him, um, I'm gonna pray about this. I said, uh, uh, don't go any further on anything. I'm gonna pray about this. So I called Dean Gagnon on the phone. Those of you that know, know Dean, he's a wheeler dealer guy. And uh, I had no idea what, uh, what to do. And, and so uh, anyway, uh, they, uh, Dean said, call him back and tell him we'll take him to lunch tomorrow and that we have a plan. I said, what's the plan? He said, I don't know, I'll figure it out tonight. <laughs> So, so I called him up and I said, hey, we'll take you to lunch tomorrow. He said, well, I'm always in for a free lunch, but he said, I don't see how there's any way to this. I said, no, we got a plan. He said, what is it? I said, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> so I had no idea. So the next day I met Dean and uh, I said, what's the plan? He said, well, he said, you won't believe it. So he said, let me just wait till I tell him. So we went to lunch and uh, we, we took this guy. And, and so finally Dean said, well, here's the plan. And the guy's like, yeah. He said, I don't think there's any possibility. He said, well, now listen to this. Dean said, we have this new building and we only have a handful of people in it. And he said, so we don't need all the septic capacity that we have on this building and, and the school building because the school building was empty. It was, it was totally undone totally unfinished, nothing in it. And so he said, uh, we have a lot of ca septic capacity. And he said, we will go to the city and we will ask the town for, uh, for approval to, to, put a, uh, to put a pump in and pump your stuff down to our septic system until, uh, until uh, the sewer goes down, down the road. And he said, they're talking about doing that within the next couple of years. And he said, then we'll shut off our pump and you guys be on the city and we'll be all good to go. And I looked at the guy and it was like, he's going, well, if you can sell the city on it, okay. I thought, they'll never buy that. <laughs> never. This is Vermont, all those tree huggers, they're never gonna go for this. Well, we went down and Dean Gagnon sold it to them and sold it to EPA and they approved it and, and God miraculously let them do what they would never do today. You would never have something like that happen today. And God did it and sewer went down and Pine Ridge got off of our sewer. We had our full capacity. The church was growing, the school began to grow and we needed the capacity and just at the right time, we shut off the pump. They went on the sewer. God just did miraculous things. That's just one thing, but it was happening all the time. The hand of God was incredible in what he did. I am so thankful that I got to be a part of that. And some of you were here. You got to be a part of that. And you got to see God just doing what no man could ever do. It was what the Lord did. When I say to you, you are walking on sacred ground. This is a special place that God has chosen in Vermont. Of all places, this is a lighthouse that God ordained and has raised up like he did the children of Israel. And this is certainly the place of miracles. I hope that you cherish that. And certainly some of you that are new people, 
that as you hear these stories and these things, you relish where God has brought you. It is a very special place. I'd like to invite the choir members up as we kind of have a time of transition. Thank you, Pastor Sturzbaugh and the folks that participated in the video. It was uh, gracious to hear the angel of the Lord speak, Brother Charlie Wellner, uh, the beginning of that. I'm sure he's using that resonant voice in heaven tonight or this afternoon. But now we're going to <clears throat> turn the program and recognize one of our servants.
at this time, I'd like to invite Ron Newhart to come <clears throat> to the platform and share a word of testimony about Cheryl Reno. All right, it's great to be with you. Great to see everybody again. Uh, after uh, being away for a couple of years, it's uh, still great to make acquaintances after we were here. For, my name is Ron Newhart, my wife Patsy is back with me for the people that are new here. I was here for 35 years uh, and saw some of the, <laughs> some of the great miracles that happened uh, uh, in the time that Pastor Schwarzbach just talked about uh, and uh, prayed fervently for God to work through those times. And he did, amen, for his faithfulness. So, um, so I'm a little bit uh, prejudiced here in my delivery of my uh, <laughs> recognition, but, uh, but I'll try and be as unbiased as I can here. But I uh, have a privilege of recognizing uh, my sister-in-law, Cheryl. Um, and, I, and I have some information that uh, the other people don't have because I'm connected with the family, right? <laughs> so, so I'll give you a little background. Uh, you know, uh, from a very early age, uh, Cheryl's ambition was always to be a secretary. That's what she wanted to be and what she wanted to do. Uh, she did go to Bob Jones University and majored in a uh, in one-year business program. Uh, and was actually secretary to the Dean of Women in, uh, in, in Bob Jones for a little bit. She came back to Burlington and, and uh, got a job working for GE as a secretary. And then uh, she started coming to Trinity when Trinity was first started. And uh, she met the guy that uh, sat around the pickle barrel, uh, Wayne Reno, and uh, the rest of that is history. Uh, uh, so uh, if I had to take, get two words to describe Cheryl's service, uh, it's uh, dependable and adaptable. Bob Jones Sr. said the greatest ability is dependability, right? And I think that that describes Cheryl's years of service here for more than 20 plus years as a secretary in a lot of different roles. I'm not sure how many people realize she went back and forth between the church and school and always in a case where we needed you know, her at that place at that time. Uh, you know, multiple pastoral and staff transitions, you know, through the years, she was the rock in the office. You know, well, how do you do this? Where, where is this? How do you get there? You know, who knows this? Talk to Cheryl. <laughs> uh, and she was equally effective in both the church and the school. Uh, you know, and think about the transition from when she started in 1988, when she was Pastor Sturzbaugh's first secretary, uh, starting out with shorthand, uh, you know, working to IBM Selectric typewriters, to uh, uh, a Mac computer. Remember the first, you know, you guys, some of you guys are too young. <laughs> first Mac computer, you know, that, uh, that we were using Mac computers back then. Uh, but her, her work always made us look good. You know, the, I can remember bef when I was under Paul Weaver, I'd always ask, you know, we never had a bulletin. You know, it was like, that wasn't the thing to do, right? And I, I always said, why not? Why can't we have a bulletin? And I remember talking to Pastor Sturge when he first came and said, like, you know, I think we should have a bulletin. I think that would be a good idea so people know what's going on and what the, what the announcements are and what's happening. And, and Cheryl turned out a bulletin. And that Sunday, somebody handed me the very first bulletin and said, here, <laughs> here's your bulletin. Um, and she, you know, another thing that typified her service was she always ran the, the office with integrity. You knew uh, if you got, if sh she couldn't get the answer, she would get the right answer and she would make sure everything was, was handled properly. She's a super organizer, just amazing. Uh, and she originated the, the famous Tickler file. You know, a year ago, we did this. Do you think we should do that again? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think we should do that. Uh, she was instrumental in m many uh, VBSs, you know, in terms of the administrative help that resulted in them becoming successful events. There's so many details behind the scenes that get managed in the office that you're not aware of. So, uh, 
But most of all, I think she loved being able to serve. Sorry. <laughs> so they, they asked Kirk and us to, and me to do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but, but most of all, I think she loved being able to use her skills and abilities to serve the Lord. And I think that's... Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. And Micah 6.8, which we sang this morning, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. To God be the glory for all he's done. Amen. So I appreciate Ron crying first, <laughs> and also giving you a little bit of historical background about who Cheryl is. I want to give you a little perspective of how Cheryl operated. Uh, over the course of her tenure here, as Ron mentioned, she bounced back and forth between uh, being the pastor secretary and being the school administrator's uh, secretary and, and doing everything well. And, uh, as I would have involvement and opportunity to be in whatever office she was in, I would always come in and I'd say, Mrs. Reno, Trinity Baptist Church's central nervous system. <laughs> and she would always look at me and she said, well, you got the nervous right. <laughs> but she always, always was grace under pressure. And the reason being is because she had a, an extremely large CPU that's the central processing unit of a computer, okay? And it <laughs> interacts with the hard drive. So this is all the remembering of everything that needed to be done, and this is how she manipulated everything. Those two things work together. Pastor Sturzbaugh, when he came by, he would often pull this out of his pocket. This was his computer. Seriously, a three by five card. And he would tell us, if it's not on this card, I won't remember it, didn't he, Cheryl? So. It was important for Cheryl to operate as efficiently as she could because there was no way Pastor could do everything he needed to do by only operating with a three by five card. And it is that kind of faithful servant that Cheryl has been all these years ministering for the Lord here at Trinity Baptist Church and School. Thank you, Cheryl, for your service. Pastor. Oh, I know you say, not him again. But, but Cheryl is my secretary, and I've been a pastor now for over 45 years, so I've had a lot of secretaries. But Cheryl is the best one ever. Uh, that is the greatest compliment that I can give her because uh, I have had some wonderful secretaries through the year, but through the years. But she, uh, she uh, took shorthand. Uh, she was diligent, she, was, she had integrity, and one thing about a pastor's secretary is they have to be confidential. They have to keep stuff that nobody else knows, not even my wife. And Cheryl had to keep those things, and she was, she was that integrity lady that you could always count on. So one day, uh, Bob Jones University got this wise idea that they were going to give uh, financial credit to all of, the, uh, all of the Christian school teachers and all the Christian school staff. And so Cheryl was the secre my secretary at the church. And she had a couple of kids, I think two or three kids at BJ at the time. And this was gonna be a huge thing. So, uh, the school administrator said to me, you're gonna to have to give up Cheryl, she's gonna to have to come to the school. I said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I said, y you're gonna to have to do something. I can't run on a 355 card. <laughs> and, and he said, nah, well, I don't see any way around it. I said, well, I'm gonna call the school. So I called the school and I talked to, talked to the president of the university. And I said to him, hey, you can't do this to me. I said. <laughs> What's the difference if she's in that office or this office, just across the street? He said, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't help you. He said, you're going to have to let her go. 
and it was like it was like tearing off my right arm. Uh, she went to the school, but the parents loved her, the teachers loved her, the kids loved her. A great school secretary, and she did a wonderful job there. And I survived. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I survived ba barely, and God gave me a secretary that helped me, uh, helped me incredibly and, and very specially. But Cheryl is that dependable lady. You could count on her, and a, a woman of integrity, and uh, one that was selfless, who was willing to, to do whatever it took to do the job for God. And uh, I salute her today. We as a church, fa you as a church family, uh, have had a wonderful treasure from the Lord all of these years. I got to work with her. I can tell you that firsthand. God bless you, Cheryl. We, we have one more thing, Cheryl, but it requires for you to come up front, please. Wayne, you can come with her if you'd like. You'd have the special memory of Trinity and verse on it. So, done in a tin. We know it's a special place to you and your special lady to us. All right. Please stay standing. This next song is, is one of Cheryl's favorite. We're going to sing All I Have is Christ.
All right, so this is uh, something we started a couple years ago, just working on, a, a, if you would, a vision statement and uh, uh, looking forward and, and trying to strategic plan and, and uh, to reflect on what God has already done. Uh, we've done that today. I'm very thankful for the 47 years God has given to us. Uh, and really, our prayer is, as Paul would pray in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, really as he closes out a prayer and he reminds us of this wonderful truth, uh, that God is able to do far more than uh, beyond what we ask or think. And that, I'm, I don't know about you, but sometimes I love to dream big. <laughs> and uh, then I'm reminded that no matter how big I dream, my God is much bigger than that. And he loves his church far more than I ever will. Uh, and he's for his church far more than any of us are. Uh, and that's good news because his church is not a place, it's a people. And he gives his people a place, which this what this property represents. This building is just a place God has given to us for this time to be stewards over uh, as an investment for the advancement of his glory in his church, which is among people. And so God is doing a people work, and some of that requires peop- uh, buildings and facilities, and we're thankful for the ones that he's given to us and uh, look forward to seeing what God will do. Uh, some a truth that we've been trying to capture over this last year especially, as just language uh, creates our culture, the culture, the values, the statements of our church, uh, we've had these banners up here, and they're not just meant to be statements. They're really value statements, meant to be principles upon which ministry is built. Uh, and so then getting into the whole issue of discipleship, using language consistently, because uh, here's the reality. In the New Testament scriptures, uh, not all disciples were believers, meaning there were people who followed Jesus, who people would have called disciples, like a Judas, who proved out not actually to be believers. But every believer is a disciple. And then every believer who is a disciple is really called by a great commission by our Lord uh, to engage in the work of making other disciples. And so our burden is to really make sure we're uh, talking about the same thing. We talk about disciples using the same language. What does it mean to be involved in discipleship? And so uh, these definitions are before you. We want to, uh, to keep repeating them. And, and if it seems a little redundant, uh, it's meant to make sure that when we say disciple, we all mean the same thing. We talk about discipleship, we all mean the same thing. Language creates the value system of your church, of your culture, of your church, and we place a priority on this simple reality that God has us here uh, for his glory, and that involves us in becoming Christ-like ourself. Uh, If we can't glorify God if we're not Christ-like ourself, and then Christ-like disciples have a work to do, namely make other disciples. And so that's kind of how we sum it up. So we want to be eager learners and devoted followers of Jesus who uh, love God's word and long for God's way. So that, that should describe you if you're a genuinely disciple. Discipleship, intentionality is a big idea. Entering into accountable relationships, saturated by the word, empowered by the spirit, uh, in order to reproduce. And so we want to be intentional. We want to be word saturated. We want to be accountable. And we want to, be re- we want to reproduce. Uh, so if you can catch those four words in that definition, that's really uh, the emphasis. Disciple making, again, intentionality. Uh, This is to enter into someone's life, to share Christ, uh, and then to teach them to obey, to keep his commandments. So uh, that is disciple-making. That is evangelism, disciple-making. What do we do? We enter into people's lives. We share Christ, uh, and then we help them learn how to follow Christ. And discipleship, being a Christ-like disciple is a mature believer. Uh, Big word, I highlight it. Don't miss it, faithful. Be faithful. And you're to be faithful in God, and there's all kinds of ways... Uh, that we could describe that, but that I'm trying to give those in some of that definition. Uh, but the big takeaway is to remember that God wants us to be faithful. That ultimately means we need to contribute, not just be a consumer. And that uh, is meant to take a statement against kind of the consumer culture of our day. Uh, so our mission, which I've already quoted, but this is the direction of our church, uh, what we believe, and this is just to reflect, uh, in 47 years, this church has stood for the authority of God's word. Amen. Uh, in fact, you go through the dark day they went through, what takes you through it? The authority of God's word. Returning back to what God has said, and God will be faithful even when someone is unfaithful. God will be faithful. God will build his church, and that requires the necessity of gospel preaching and, and an honest pursuit of biblical holiness in the lives of God's people. That's what sets a church apart. And so that has been a value of Trinity that we pray that we would never lose. We would preserve, protect, uh, fight for. Uh, then part of that is in, is in stepping it forward uh, in these four statements, these four principles that we hold dear, uh, that we're to love God supremely. It means uh, nothing in front of the Lord, no other gods before me, love others sacrificially, love others as Jesus loves us. 
We're to serve fervently, take the gifts and abilities God's given and use them for his glory, and we're to share Christ fearlessly. Uh, and that, in a hostile culture, that's not easy because uh, the flesh will not want to go there, uh, but grace takes you there. And so we want to be grace-filled people uh, that will share Christ fearlessly in our culture. Uh, so why now? Well, the Lord has already done... I mean, we started this process. We weren't yet uh, two campuses. God, in the midst of it, has made us two campuses. Uh, so one of our prayers is that through this reality, uh, at some point, the Lord would be pleased fill up that second campus, and that would either be the impetus for it to be an independent church again or just a church planting beachhead from both locations. However the Lord wants to do it, but that's our plan is to be faithful, continue to proclaim the gospel, see that lighthouse in Shelburne not go out, amen? Uh, we want to have that lighthouse in Shelburne, in that community, the gospel being proclaimed. Uh, I want to encourage you to invite people you know in Shelburne to come, hear the gospel. We'd love to see that place fill up. And if someday that's going to be its own independent church again, praise God. Uh, we pray that preacher's raised up here, amen? And then we'll, then we'll go on from there, and, and that, or if we just then start planting churches. Uh, Vermont needs more independent Baptist churches, folks. Need more gospel light, not less. And so uh, we can be a part of that, and that's uh, one of the things God is doing, and, and we are grateful. So that's kind of why now we are looking at that. Also, what we've learned, and, and, and we talked about this. For some of you, this would be a little new. Uh, but just life cycle of all things. All things have a life cycle. It tends to be a launch with momentum, strategic growth, gets to a level of sustainability. Uh, but at some level, we turn into kind of a maintenance, kind of keep things going. Uh, we get a little comfortable. It's easy to get complacent. Uh, but things never stay there. They slide. Okay? So when they slide and start down toward just preserving, then you're going to get the life support, and then you, then you need new birth. So... Uh, somewhere in this process, we did our own evaluation. We had people throughout the church doing evaluations. I think we did 50 different evaluations and basically came to the reality uh, that we were uh, a couple of years ago, basically starting, if you will, a new launch curve, a new, uh, having been more or less in a maintenance headed towards preservation mode, uh, really starting a new launch and, and praying for momentum. And, and uh, that's where we believe the Lord has us and we want to, uh, to get to a place with strategic growth and then ultimately, hopefully, be able to see that sustainable. Um, and then you've got kind of some of the vision statements that we've put, uh, just trying to put some metrics out in front of us to say these are some of the goals that we have, some of the visions that we have over the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, part of that is uh, in, in just setting those underneath, those four pr major principles. So with a, an envisioning of a church that we love God supremely, uh, that uh, would be good stewards, always uh, doing everything done in excellence. Uh, so we've been working on that end. Part of the whole purpose of the Kitchen Project is to bring, uh, we've kind of worked through the school. Most of it, I think, is in an excellent condition again. Uh, and we, 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 we're working throughout the grounds. We've got some other big projects. We, I mean, we've got, ultimately, we're going to have to redo our road. We've got, we got some things ahead. There's just that we've got some uh, drainage issues to fix. But all of that's part of being good stewards over all that God's given to us. Uh, the renovation of the kitchen we mentioned, the development plan we have introduced. If, by God's grace, we hope to hear uh, by the 17th of this month if that first uh, status of the development plan has been approved at Shelburne. Uh, from there, we'll be uh, soon after that calling for a church meeting uh, to present it to, as a, that which we would vote on to go forward with, uh, which then we get to all the financial ramifications of what that looks like. Um, but with the end of that being the capital would be generated, uh, that the capital being generated would then uh, get us to place some additional staff housing. Uh, part of the growth of the school is pushing our, uh, our capacity both on teaching in. Uh, so I think uh, so. Uh, Pastor Ra Rob teaches, we'll be teaching three classes next year. Three classes, Pastor uh, Randy's going to teach. Uh, I'll be teaching two classes, Rhonda's teaching one. Uh, so we are, uh, I mean, we, we, we stretch ourselves in a lot of directions. Uh, so we'll, ultimately, we're going to need to be able to add staff to continue seeing the growth of our school. And uh, we would like to do that. Also, one of the, uh, I know it's been uh, dreamed of and talked of at different times planned. And, and so how are we going to get there? So one of my burdens since uh, just understanding that is to try and see how the Lord might get us to the place where we actually would build a gym, a multi-purpose state. A facility here on this campus and uh, be able to accomplish that. So that's some of the goals in this, what we're looking towards. Uh, also, we've been doing learning, really just, uh, if you will, evaluating in our own ministry, where are we in terms of participation, 
Again, faithfulness is it. Not a, I mean, obviously everybody can get impressed by a big gift, uh, but a big gift itself may not actually be a sacrifice. If it's not a sacrifice, it probably wasn't that impressive <laughs> to the Lord. None of it's really impressive to the Lord anyway. He gave it to you all anyway in the first place. Uh, but uh, one of the things, the goal is, that, uh, is to see uh, that we would as a church be faithful to the Lord, and that means participating in regular giving. I do, I do think giving is something all God's people do. I just do. I mean, that, that pretty sure Scripture would back me up on that one. You know, I got Pastor Thurspaw has been at this longer than me, but yeah, I'm pretty sure God expects his people to give. Amen? And so that should be, and, and here's the thing, and I'll just throw it out here. This is not meant to be a Debbie Downer, but here's the reality. We're at less than 75% participation in giving. So that, why, so that metric there is to say there needs to be some growth there. So we're at less than 70, really right around 70 is really where we're going as a church, wise as far as giving. Uh, so that, that, that's one of those we pray will change, see God change that. Uh, so loving sacrificially, just as life group, we, would love, we, we think everybody needs to be in a life group. Uh, we're not at 70% participation yet. We hope to be by 2025 and 85 by 2030. We want it to be a value. Uh, that's so when people come, join the church, they just automatically get involved in life groups, D groups, you see similar metrics. Uh, we really do put a lot into those as far as their, their part, the role they play in discipleship, growing in missions giving. Uh, we want to be able to take on new gospel partners. Amen? Uh, we, we do. We want to be there. And at this point in time right now, our giving at missions is basically level with what goes out the door. Uh, actually, it's a little less. We send more out than comes in through mission giving. Uh, so that means it comes out of the general fund. That's what that means. Uh, so we'd like to see that grow. We'd actually like to have an emergency fund for missions giving. Uh, so that we'd be able to meet those as, 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 different, as our gospel partners have needs. Uh, part of serving Christ uh, fervently is just striving to create a culture of discipleship, not a culture driven by program. Again, ministry support teams, just seeing that participation grow. Uh, we've got great, I mean, and again, support teams are, are there just to create avenues of using gifts and abilities, but we'll create new ones uh, as the Lord gives us people to lead them. And then engaging in discipleship in an individual level, meaning really sharing the gospel freely in our, co- in our community, keeping up evangelistic prayer lists. Those are part of our goals. Uh, create, maintain meaningful evangelistic prayer lists. There's there uh, that we would contribute at least two names of unsaved people in our community that we are praying regularly for. Uh, God is the God who answers prayer. You've already heard so many testimonies to that. Uh, God reminds us over and over again. The psalmist reminds us over and over again. I cry to the Lord and he heard me. I cry to the Lord, and he heard me. Uh, we want to cry to the Lord for unsaved people in our community. Uh, if we're not burdened for the unsaved people in our community, there's something wrong with our heart as a church. Uh, and, and so our heart needs to be right with the Lord. If it's right with the Lord, uh, we're going to be burdened for the lost. Jesus died to save, and Jesus is mighty to save. And so we, believing that, want to cry and call out to the Lord to save people in this community and see God continue to see the waters of baptism stirred. By the way, next Sunday, we are having a baptism. If uh, you are waiting, and you need to see us this week, because we do have a couple scheduled to be baptized next week. Uh, so we'll be doing that next Sunday. Anyway, uh, then 50% included in uh, doing personal evangelism training. Uh, we want to make sure you're ready to share the gospel. If you haven't been to training, that doesn't mean you get a pass. <laughs> you know, the easiest thing in the world to do is take a gospel track and memorize it. Take one that you find your favorite, memorize it, and then keep it with you, and you're always prepared to share the gospel. Oh, by the way, the back of your bulletin is a gospel track. So there's an easy one that you can memorize and take with you everywhere and use it freely. Uh, a copyright out of it, as my seminary professor would say. All right? So continue open door initiatives, just programs that we have. The Lord's been very kind to us. Open up a number of different avenues for us to reach new people in this community. Uh, we've had lots and lots of visitors, lots of guest opportunities, lots of opportunities to share the gospel with new people. That's been a blessing. It's been encouraging. Uh, you, I, I know we are praying because we're seeing more and more opportunities like that come. Larger groups of people, both in our preschool program, school programs, all kinds of ways. Uh, we did a funeral this year, just several actually, with a, 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 just so many guests, opportunities uh, to present the gospel. So you keep praying uh, and we keep developing and see the Lord open hearts. Uh, so we would like to see a uh, number of attendees uh, double at my 2025 regular attendance at Shelburne. 
a self-sustaining level by 2030, so in 10 years we'd like to see it at a self-sustaining level and hire staff, open up a second Little Lambs on that campus. Uh, it's one of the things we'd like to do. Uh, so those are some of the goals. Here's the kitchen project. I don't know how well that is viewable from your seats. So, uh, Steve, you want to describe it? You want me just to point it out? Uh, well, you're welcome to come up and take it away. This is your drawing, my friend. Steve's been working on this, and uh, I'll let him describe it. And then I'll have the guys per get prepared, and we'll receive our anniversary offering. I don't, that's one slide, right? I guess one slide. Okay. Wow. <laughs> my eyes used to work a lot better when I was about 30 years younger. But anyways, so the, the kitchen project is, is kind of an exciting thing to me. I've seen that kitchen since the day it was built, when it was built as a home ec kitchen. Remember, it had little outlets in the floor that were supposed to be to plug sewing machines in, and it never, it never did that. It had a little sink so you could do little, little stuff in there, but it's turned into a real kitchen, but it's not built as a real kitchen. So you've been to sweetheart banquets, junior, senior banquets where the whole room was transferred into something else, Christmas banquets. Everybody here has been in that room and eaten a meal in there, maybe hundreds of meals. So that room fellowship is a really important part of our church. And so that space is really important. The one thing that's sort of outgrown is the kitchen. So the plan is to use the same footprint of that kitchen, but basically gut it out. Okay? New floors that are cleanable, new ceilings that are cleanable, new wall surfaces that are cleanable, like you have in a real kitchen, uh, a new stove that's not that one we got a long, long time ago for free. We've gotten a lot of good use out of that old stove, but it's ready for wherever stoves go after they die. <clears throat> and there's, a, there's freezer space. We already, we already have a freezer sitting over there that we got for free. It's an $8,000 freezer that's, that we got for free. We just replaced the refrigerator because the old one croaked, and, and we got a really good deal on it. So it's a brand-new refrigerator there. There's a stainless steel, you can't see it very well in this picture, but there's a stainless steel island that was in a Burger King store in Barrie, the job that I worked on, that they demoed the store and they were going to throw this stuff away. So I scarfed it up like I've had this bad habit of doing before. Anyways, we got the, we've got the stainless steel island that we already own that. Um, there's going to be a dishwasher in this kitchen. You know, one, a real dishwasher, not one like you have at home, but one that the sides pull up and it takes about three minutes for it to wash a tray of dishes, like in a real kitchen. So there'll be one of those, so you don't have to stand there for an hour after dinner's done and wash all the dishes up. And we don't, when you wash dishes, you're supposed to have really hot water, right, in the kitchen. We're going to put a real water heater in that heats water so it's really hot, almost so hot you can't touch it, so you can wash dishes safely and efficiently. Uh, it's one hurdle is it's 550 square feet that's how big the room is now actually that's not bad for a kitchen so we got plans to utilize that space but basically throw away stuff that's not usable put in good stuff uh, at this point we're looking at and I don't have an exact number but between 50 and 70 thousand dollars is what the estimate is to do what I just described now, we've had very good success in this church of making a dollar worth two dollars. That's happened over and over and over again here. It happened with the bathroom renovations. It's happened all over. So our goal is to use the Lord's money very, very wisely and try and stretch a dollar into two dollars and get the most value we can get out of that kitchen, but, but end up with a kitchen that's very usable, that's going to last for a long time, and that someday we'll be able to have a dinner over there where you'll be able to walk in that kitchen and say, wow, this is beautiful. Thank you, Lord. But, but that isn't going to happen all by itself. Okay? This will be a lot of work, and it will take some money. But we really feel that this is, this is a project that needs to be done. Now, here's, here's a challenge that I have for everybody here. All of, us, all of us know people that are either school alumni or people that have been in this ministry before that have benefited from that room over there. And I've talked to some of them, okay? And, and, I, and they've said, oh yeah, we'd like to help with a project like that. 
So I think there's a lot of people out there other than there's, there's all of us that will do our part. But I think there's a lot of other people out there that have benefited from Trinity Baptist School and Trinity Baptist Church that would love to be part of fixing that room up because it benefits everybody. So if you think of some of those people, uh, we'll come out, we're going to come out with some kind of a little brochure, something to announce that project clearly that we can get some funds in, not only from ourselves, but from some other people. And the faster we get the funds in, the faster that project will happen. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm an optimist, so you've got you to factor this in. But my goal is by next summer, next summer, we could renovate that project. We could renovate that place during the summertime. If, if the funds are available, we'll organize this. So next, by the end of next summer, that, that project could be a reality. So pray about it. And if, when you walk through there, picture how cool that could look if we had the money. And, and that we could make that happen because it's, it's really a necessity. Best picture will be uh, available on our website, so you'll be able to look at it. So you pull it up and look at it and see kind of the layout and the design. And then, uh, so yes, we would love to. And if I, I can, you know, my, my optimistic bone goes to my next anniversary service, I'd like the kitchen to be in place. Amen? So school gets out. That means we stop June. We have it ready by July. Now that's quick. See, Randy, you're going to be busy. All right. <laughs> uh, we are going to be busy. Amen. I'm going to have Pastor Randy come. He's going to close. We're going to take our offerings. And men, you're going to come. Pastor Randy, you're going to come pray uh, for our offering and the close of the service. Uh, and so consider what the Lord would have you do as you invest. And again, this is anniversary Sunday. Uh, so anything that says anniversary for really, uh, if you give it later, sometime later, if you either put kitchen or anniversary on it, it will end up in the right fund, okay? Uh, so we're going to be, uh, we, as the money's come in, some of these things we can get done quicker than others. So Lord willing, uh, we hope to have before the school year a new hot water heater in place, which will actually help with the hot dishes. Uh, hot dishes, yeah. They'll, they'll be hot after you put them under hot water anyway. Uh, so it'll help with the hot water issue. So we want to get that done. Uh, so that'll be one of the first things we get done. And then we're going to work, uh, as we have the funds available, we'll work uh, intelligently, accomplish different pieces that we can uh, before we just gut the room out. But then we'll, we'll be ready, hopefully by next summer, uh, to do that. So Randy, if you want to lead us in prayer, and we will take the offering, and then we'll, uh, after that, I'd say it's time to uh, change into some, hopefully, so you're going to stay. If you don't want to play in your church clothes, it's fine. Uh, all the games are down. Uh, at, at near the soft, we have, anybody ever play Chicago softball? Do you know what that is? Pastor Rob does because he's from Chicago. Okay. And you ever play softball called a mush ball softball? Okay. It's a huge, like 16 ounce, 16 inch softball. So even though all of you maybe say, I can't play softball, I can't hit one of those. It's like a beach ball. Okay. Now here's the other thing. It's not quite a beach ball size. It doesn't go very far. So all of you worried about the big hitter is going to knock it all out. It, it, I promise. They'll hit as hard as they want to. Uh, it's not going real far. It's actually a game designed to be played without gloves. Now, we will, some of us have gloves, so if you're really afraid of the ball, you can use a glove. Uh, but uh, so we're going to try some Chicago softball for anybody who wants to play. A nine square, if you've never done that, it's a game with the Wilds we've all loved. It's down there. Uh, if you need to be corralled, get in the gaga pit, all right? So uh, do remember that as soon as we're dismissed, uh, the creamy truck is still here for a half hour or so. Uh, you can go get a refill and then go down, sugared up, and then you play until you fall down. Uh, so something like that. Uh, but the Gaga fits there. We've got uh, volleyball set up. We relocated the volleyball net. Brand new volleyball. That's set up. Uh, we've got some long games people have brought. So there's some. Uh, so we'll have a lot of things down here. Uh, so come down, enjoy the fellowship, change, get casual, uh, and and just let's have some fun together this afternoon. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And please, I, we hope you can stay and enjoy each other's company. Our Heavenly Father, you've told us in your word that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so, Father, we're asking you that you continue to build this house, not only the buildings, but the hearts and the lives of the people that make up Trinity Baptist Church. Heavenly Father, we look to you to do great, miraculous things amongst us. Increase our faith, Father, as you do, and teach us to pray that you might be pleased to continue to pour out great blessings in our behalf. 
Father, we pray that you'd help us to be serious and intentional about getting involved. As we heard from some of the older men, how many hours they put in, and perhaps we can't always do those things, but we can do a little bit more than we have and have a part, Father, in helping to build this ministry for your glory. So, Lord, whether we're old or young, whomever we may be, Father, may you use us in a special way to build this, your church, that you might be glorified and many might come under the sound of the precious gospel message. Father, we pray you'd use this offering now to be a blessing to all of the upcoming needs, and we think particularly of a kitchen project that we'd really like to see uh, fixed and straightened out and made better by next summer even. We ask that you might do above all that we could ask or think. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.